All right. All right, what are we doing? Figure episode. That's right. All right, well, we got to pump it out. No chit chat. No Boba, chit chat. Boss, IG, the no, 8, no, FX no intro. And be like, hey, use the next four figures and let's get to it. Welcome to another episode of Five Idiots Talking Toys. It is the ultimate guide to collecting vintage Star Wars figures. We are going to jump into the next four figures in this series. Thanks for joining us tonight. You can find out everything you need to know about the show in the links below in the description, fiveidiotstalkingtoys.com. And if you like what we're doing, if you're enjoying this episode, please like the video, comment, subscribe to the channel, and go to patreon.com slash fiveidiotstalkingtoys for all additional content and previews of everything we do. Thanks for supporting the show. Let's bring the fellas in now. Christopher W. is coming to you from the basement. Brandon A. is coming to you from the garage. And John W. is coming from Human Resources. Welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us. What's up, fellas? What's hey, up? John. Hey, is this your yeah, last day in the store? Is this your last no. episode? Last this, episode in the store? It may, be our, it may be the last episode in the store, yeah. Oh, wow. my God. Okay. Maybe. Yeah. John has a, uh, a vintage the toy and variety for... store that's going to go fully online, so he's uh, making that transition yeah. as we speak. We've done an episode on reflecting upon the last you know, year and a half you've been open. Rogue Five go. Toys is going to be doing the same thing, fully automated online soon. Fully automated. Just Rogue Five Toys. Fully automated. Rogue just, Five Toys. Just add it to the cart and check out. No talking. Yep. <laughs> We've got, <laughs> We've got uh, direct messages. We have Oompa Loompas and it's working for us. Yes. <laughs> All right, guys. Let's jump into the purpose of this episode. There's folks that are hopefully here because they want to learn about these figures. They want to learn more about these figures than they already know, hopefully. And uh, we can help you do that as you're collecting Kenner Vintage Star Wars. Uh, what's the count now? What is there? 92, 97? I always forget what you count and you don't count. But... Uh, I think last week it was 96, and now it's 108. I don't know, it Something day. like that. All <laughs> right. Well, we're. Uh, I think we're officially, as of this episode, John, we're 20 figures in. Is that correct? That is correct. All right, great. So if you want to see the first 12, the quote-unquote first 12 that came out originally in 1978, you can go back and check those episodes uh, on our channel here on YouTube, or if you're listening to us on a podcast app, come on over to YouTube so you can see... Uh, See our dumb faces and uh, these figures that we'll talk about. And uh, you can also see, you know, the whole first 20 that came out. We're going to jump in right now with the first figure that came out post uh, Star Wars, now known as A New Hope, Episode 4. And I'll bring that up on the screen here now. He is, of course, Boba Fett. Boba Fett. Boba right. Fett. Boba. So, so this figure, uh, you know, this character, this figure, uh, was released. There was a lot of hubbubaloo that this was going to be a new character that was not in the first movie that was going to introduce everybody to a new movie called Empire Strikes Back. Uh, we're talking about 1981, so, you know, pushing two and a half-ish years after the original figures were released. And, you know, from everything we know, this figure garnered a lot of excitement because it was announced on the 20 backs, right? Chris, uh, I have that right? He was announced on the 20 backs with a, a sticker on the front or, or there was mention on the back of some of the cards, right? Well, they had a mail-away going on also where you could yeah. mail away and, and True. you know, and get them. So I believe he was referred to as a bounty hunter. I'm not even... They did give his name, but a lot of excitement about this this figure. You know, the way the figure looks, just very, um, you know, now iconic, but different than anything anybody had seen. You know, maybe in the vein of the Stormtroopers, that was a very unique look for the first movie as well. And uh, 
from what I know about this character, you know, there's there's now modern versions of a prototype Boba Fett, which is all white. They originally intended this figure to be among the stormtroopers, you know, some sort of a commander, part of the stormtroopers, and that's why he was originally done in all white as they were prototyping this character, let alone toy figure. Um, but then that evolved to becoming a bounty hunter that you know worked for the Empire. So I'm going to throw it over to you, John. Right. Now, um, this figure, um, I don't think I really need to say anything more about it, but I'd like to hear what you have to say about the accessory. Uh, well, this figure, I want to just say something really quickly about this figure. Uh, there was a lot of anticipation about this figure because I remember I was like 10 years old. Brandon and, said you were in college. No. No. <laughs> No, but I remember I was 10 years old and I remember all the hype over this figure and this character. Yeah, and he even showed up in a parade. Uh, yeah. There's like a video of him in a parade in 1978. Yeah. Uh, next and to, like, next to Vader. That? Yeah, Vader. everybody's like, who is that? You know, uh, I think we have some videos back in the Wayback Machine that, had, that I put the parade <clears> up. And I'll see if I can find that clip again. I think Disney but, has a special on it as well. <clears throat> yeah. So, but this uh, Boba Fett comes with an Imperial blaster, of course. And uh, the, the, do I should I talk about the variant, like the Taiwan blaster? Yes. Yeah. Now everyone says that the Taiwan blaster came with just Boba Fett, right? The V five or the M whatever M sixteen eighty four seven. Yeah. Uh, version of the blaster. I always know it as the V5, and I've, you know, I'll always refer to it as the V5. But anyway, Same. but he had the V5 blaster with the Taiwan. Um, it was most common with the Taiwan. And just like everything else, they got buckets of blasters at the factory. And who knows, you know, how many actually, how many Taiwan figures actually came with a V5 blaster, right? Because I did have a carded example of a, of a Death Squad commander that had a V5 blaster. Mm -hmm. So it could have gotten mixed up and in, in everything. But anyway, it is an Imperial blaster and the V5s are gray. The V5 blasters are gray. False. True. Dark, dark gray. False. Dark gray? Yes, they're dark gray. Blue. blue. They're false. Blue. Black. False. I. There, uh, there Paul are Gusa quite a few shades on my side. What is all this gray talk? I don't. John, did we have this conversation John multiple Paul times? Gusa, we did. Gray is in your beard. <laughs> yeah, did. he's talking about his beard. All the different grays that are in the beard. <laughs> this is why. Yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. So one, the one thing I didn't mention is that this figure comes in a Hong Kong. Obviously, it comes in a made in Taiwan. Is there a no COO? Is, uh, what else am I missing? I'm not the biggest Boba Fett expert in terms of the you know the COOs. I don't. There's no no COO because there's a the big C. The uh, tri logo one usually would have the no COO, but it came with the PBP, I think, on it. I think. Okay, and then there's a big C, Brandon. Yeah, you know that has a large C, which is the large, large copyright. C. It's the same thing as a short V. It's not real. No one cares. It means nothing. <laughs> it's, um, it's a different mold uh, next to the dart, that little uh, thing that goes on his arm. Yeah. Okay. The little nub that sticks out. If it doesn't have the little nub, it is a large C variant. Okay. And then there's, you know, there's quite a few variants, whether you want to argue that variants, uh, you know, are, are, are recognized across the board or they're not, but there's also some different paint applications. There's also some, um, you know, versions that, you know, ep, uh, you know, examples where there's a missing, you know, painted knee or a dart or whatever. So let me throw it over to Brandon now. He's going to go through the figure a little bit more fine and tell you what we're usually looking for. Uh, in, in coming up with a condition for this figure. So this figure is probably one of the ones that has the most paint applications on it. Uh, so therefore, it's going to have some of the most you know paint rubs and, and stuff like that. Um, I'll start off with the paint first from head to toe. Obviously, the, the helmet there, the red, is uh, notorious for little paint oversprays. Uh, on his face, um, obviously the paint is uh, rubs on his front of his helmet there because that part is protruding 
a little bit further out. Um, next thing that you notice the most on Boba Fett is the chest paint. So 99 times out of 100, people look at the chest paint first because that paint application on there was very thin. Um, and there wasn't a lot of heavy paint put on there. So it scratches very easy or it has a little bit of a translucency to it um, because it wasn't paint, painted, uh, you know, full or correctly. Uh, so you want to check that for sure. The belt next is uh, definitely under the arms. You might see some rub areas on the pouches uh, again. And the belt protrudes there um, to his right side. That's got those two little nubs sticking out. So you want to check for any kind of paint wear there. Um the knee pads and, and you know his shoulder pads and, and his arm um, buckles there. I mean, those usually have some paint wear, but those aren't too bad because those parts really aren't protruding too much. But you obviously have to check those as well. Uh, on the back, which I don't know if we have a picture of, but um, obviously this figure was not rocket firing, so people would try to pull the rocket on it uh, when they were playing with it. Some people used you know maybe pliers or whatnot. So you always want to check. Uh, the red rocket in the back to make sure that there's no rub on it. Um, John. <laughs> anyway, the backpack. You want to look at the backpack and make sure there's no paint rub there. I wish we had a better picture of it, but um, usually some blue paint rub on the backpack as well. And then this figure is notorious for degradation. So uh, the arms and the legs and the head might be a different color than the torso because the paint is degrading on it and it's also prone to plastic cancer as well usually the degradations i think people kind of like those because it, it makes it look a little different uh sometimes you have one arm and one leg or or vice versa or two arms and no legs or, or whatever but people love the, the different colored limbs on this boba but for sure the thing you need to look at the most is the paint when you first get them yeah mm. Yeah, that uh, chest paint, the way you were describing it was good. It, it's almost like a glaze as opposed to a paint. Like it's like you said, translucent is the perfect word for it. It's right. not thick, op opaque paint like the uh, the yellow is or the brown yeah. is. So it seems to wear really easily. I tried to clean one one time, and I rubbed the paint right off. Ah. So you need to be very careful when you're trying to clean these figures. Yeah, and you're going to see some... some I'm sorry, Chris. I was just going to say you're going to see some differences with the paint too. There's a, a, a medium yeah. brown, a dark brown belt. A, some call uh, you know the the darkest one a black belt. So you know depending on the COO or when it was made or or, or you know yeah. what what Gertrude ate for lunch you know lunch that day in the factory and what color she chose to uh, to pick up. You're going to see some different paint. Uh, Chris, over to you for this for this figure. I was going to say uh, Hong Kong Fets came out on the Star Wars and the ESB line only because then Taiwan was on the Jedi cards. Right. But the ones that degrade are only the ones that came on the ESB card. For whatever reason, Boba Fett on an ESB card, all degrade. I don't know if it's the factory, wherever it came from, Aunt Gertrude took the day off. No right. one knows. And but the baggies, at, too, right? The um, sometimes degrade. the baggies, yeah. But a lot of times, if you look at, like, the, you know, like a 20, uh, a 21 back, whatever, never degrades it's always perfectly fine yeah. in there but the esb line for whatever reason just looks like garbage when you say degrade though are you talking about the plastic or the paint or what no, specific exactly what brandon was saying before his torso and his arms torso. and yeah you know so a lot of times you'll see a graded fet on an empire mock but the figure score will be like a 70 or a 75 it's like, or even a 60. I, i've seen so many 60 scores for a fet it's not even funny not overall, just a figure score because they all degraded inside. Um, when you talk about prices, the blaster is always twenty bucks. Um, you can list them. You know, Boba Fett is all over the place. He was like a hundred dollars during the Boba Fett craze. Now he's like forty-five or fifty dollars for a decent-looking one. I mean, if you had like a really, really nice one that was mint and you did sixty-five dollars, someone would still pay it. Um, Taiwan add twenty bucks more. It could be like eighty five dollars, but not counting the V five. So if it was just a regular Taiwan with a regular blaster, you sold it eighty five bucks. You know seventy five dollars. It sells all day. And then the V five blaster itself, again, at one point those things were going for like a buck fifty to one hundred and seventy five dollars. 
I think now they came back down to earth, and I think it's like seventy five dollars now, ninety dollars. Like ninety five to uh, to like so, one hundred and fifteen. You know, just add that on top of what a Taiwan price is, and hundred and seventy five dollars, and you got a Taiwan FET with a with a V five. Yeah, and one of the things that's that's uh, once you've looked at enough of them and you've seen the difference, uh, one of the things that's easy to identify with a Taiwan is is the blue plastic it's molded in has a little bit more of a tinge of of green to it. It's a little bit yeah. more like a turquoise color as opposed mm -hmm. to a blue gray like this one is. Um, the other thing yeah, that that helmet. we haven't. I'm sorry. Say again. The painted helmet variant. Yeah, that's what I was just gonna say. Uh, the thing that uh, like kind of really interests me is I wish I knew the the true story behind um, the Taiwan <laughs> painted helmet version. Uh, you know, you just have to believe it's something along the lines of um, this. I don't know if you can see my arrow on here. Yeah, you can. This area right up here on a what's referred to as a painted blue helmet or PBH taiwan fet is there must have been some sort of paint application that was either over spray from the mask it got up on the helmet or maybe just just some kind of error in the production where paint got up here and rather than trashing the figures or trashing the heads they took a paint and color matched the plastic at the time and sprayed used some sort of a mask to spray just the top of the head to cover whatever paint was underneath it and now over time, I think especially the paint and the plastic have become different colors. And you can see that lighter blue, like baby blue paint on the helmet. Um, sometimes it's more recognizable than others. But I just love stories like that. I would love to know why that happened and who made the decision. Like, you know, you know, it was some guy with a suit and tie. And he was like, oh, you have, uh, you know, 10,000 helmets, you know, that are painted wrong. Yeah, just fix them. We're not we're not doing them over. You know, you know, we're not throwing them in the garbage. Lame but, but uh, you know, they're sought after now. So if you if you come across one of those by chance, great for you. If uh, you come across one of those and you want to add it to your collection, they're pretty pricey. They're 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 you know, four four or five times at least the price of a, a typical Taiwan. So that is Boba Fett, and next we are going to go to. I would say this is one of everybody, you know, one of a lot of people's favorite bounty hunters, Bosk. There he is. There he is. So another figure coming from Empire Strikes Back, you know, we're here with the characters uh, into the second of the Star Wars original trilogy. Mm -hmm. Bosk is uh, an interesting one. He's, uh, you know, very different looking character figure than we've gotten to this point. I guess you could say he's in the realm of the cantina creatures that we saw in the first movie, you know, similar looking um, to those, cre you know, to those creatures, those um, characters. Um, he's got a, a, you know, a fun story behind his costume that a lot of Star Wars fans have heard before. I don't recall the movie. Maybe one of you guys do. But George Lucas, you know, uh, um, saw this costume in, a, in an older sci-fi movie, you know, one of those those sci-fi movies he was probably watching as a kid and used the same costume for this character in Empire Strikes Back. Or maybe it was one of the, maybe it was the director uh, of ESB. I'm not sure, but um, so it's interesting. This, this, this costume, this, this uh, outfit exists elsewhere in sci-fi and uh, they use this for Bosk, the bounty hunter. Uh, in terms of the figure, you know, really not a lot of variations with this figure. Um, amongst you know different paint apps or anything like that it's you know brandon's going to talk about the condition um and tell you what's difficult you know about this figure in the paint apps there is quite a bit of paint on here but first we're going to throw it over to john for the accessory it's a unique one right john absolutely yeah um just a little bit on the uniform too this was a the screen used flight suit for bosk was an actual uh, royal air force pilot um, oh. flight suit and it was used in doctor who doctor who right and okay. there was a sci-fi film from the 60s 66 i think is when it came out i cannot remember the name of it but it was used in that too um <clears throat> first man on the moon or something like that i think was the name of it okay it's um, very iconic looking you know obviously probably mostly known for star wars now but it's yeah. it's a pretty awesome look yeah and uh his rifle is definitely um unique 
people talk about unique, um, uh, the unique arsenals of different figures and stuff like that. Um, but what's crazy is like, I guess because there were so many of these Bosks in production, you can sit, you can get a Bosque rifle for like six bucks. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, it was such a good looking figure that I think it sold a but, yeah. lot, you know? Yeah, it sold, they sold a lot. And, uh, but yeah, it's, it's a unique, um, uh, accessory for sure. Um, okay. The only, the only, it only came with this figure, so yeah, for sure. Yeah, I always found it interesting that the you know the grip was towards the front of the rifle, mm -hmm. uh, but that might just be what it is. It's a grip, and there's a trigger, you know, in the back. But in terms of a toy and an action figure, that's how he holds it. Yeah. And uh, I think there's maybe some variation in the shades, a uh, shade of a couple of releases of this, but we don't really get into that on this show too much. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, just talking about molds. slight, you know, different blues. Yeah. Um, unless there's something significant behind it, Brandon. Let's uh, let's throw it to you for the condition. I know this is one of your favorite figures in the line, uh, so and you know it pretty well. So let us know what to look for when we're finding yeah, like, looking uh, for a nice con nice example. I compare this figure to a Luke Pilot. Uh, a lot of problem areas usually due to the white uh, paint apps on this figure. But starting from top to bottom here, obviously we have the head there. There's there's another uh, head that. Uh, they do like olive head and orange head, depending on you know what factory it came from or 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 whatnot. But usually the face is okay. Um, sometimes you might see a different variant. I know somebody will probably cover it here, but like the painted lips or the lipstick variant, um, you might see some with a little bit more paint on the lips there. But uh, the torso on this figure is the biggest problem area that it has because of the white paint. Uh, a lot of scratching can happen on the areas that are that are protruding there on the chest and on the belt. So always check those areas and then flipping them around on the backside. Same thing. The back always gets, you know, some kind of scratches or, or extra paint thrown on there from from who knows what. Um, the same thing on, on his uh, his butt region there. Because if you were to put them like in a cockpit, the, the straps would also wear on there. Uh, so very hard figure to find and with very nice paint. The limbs on this figure, I mean, usually you'll you'll see some paint missing on like the thumbs and the, and the tip of the hand there and on the toes of his feet or his claws or whatever you want to call them. But usually paint's missing there. Um, the biggest thing besides the paint on the chest and on the back that you need to worry about is degradation. So the limbs on this figure degrade pretty regularly especially with the orange head uh variation of it um it almost there's the back yes yeah, so you can see that that you know this one has butt rub right there on the on the right strap um and then the back usually gets i don't know some black dots or lines or something on there but going back to the degradation you'll see it turn like this pearlescent pale orange yellowish they're actually kind of cool looking when they degrade um and I've got some pretty nice ones that are pearlescent all the way through that look that actually look really nice. Uh, so they're one of the de degraded figures that, that I think people collect because at least I collect them because they look pretty cool and they're degraded like that. But yeah, I think we covered you know everything on them. Um, again, you know the, the straps in the front and back of the chest there are the the number one thing on this figure that I look for. Yeah, when you're talking about the the green head and the and you know the olive head and the orange head, you know sometimes it's olive or green, but um, sometimes for folks it's a little difficult to tell what they have um, when you can compare a couple of them next to each other. You know, obviously then then it becomes easier. You're really talking about a, an olive color and then almost like a mustardy color. You know, the the orange quote unquote orange is not orange. Obviously, it's just got a little bit more of a yellow or an orange tone to it so uh you can use some references online obviously to, to check onto that the, the uh, orange head is mostly referred to as the earlier release it's the first release so most of the baggies you saw when he came out in the mail away have an orange head because it was okay. like the first one that came out and like brandon said it degrades so much that to even get an 80 on him like a loose graded figure 80 and over is impossible for for an orange head um, okay. pri price wise, he's fifteen to twenty dollars because the blaster, like John said, is six to eight bucks. The figure, you know, depending on how nice it is. Now, I've sold one just a few months ago, and it was fifty dollars. 
but if I sell a thousand box like a year, I'm I I usually don't even see one really nice one. This one was by far the nicest one I ever saw. And I was like, I'm either keeping this in my collection or I'm listing it for fifty dollars. And it sold instantly. Because I think other people know that he's mm. just so hard to grade. So hard. It really I never is. if I find a really nice one, I almost will never sell it. Yeah, so he's just really hard. So fifteen to twenty dollars is the normal ballpark. If you saw one for fifty dollars, forty dollars, and it was beautiful, buy it all day long. Buy it because if you wanted to grade it, you can. It's more than worth it. You can see the degradation on this guy. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Just by looking at it, how pale it is, and then it has the like a pale. Hair. Yeah, it's like a pale pastel yellow type thing. Brandon, drop your hand hand down a bit. It's it's focusing on your your shirt, I think. Like the letters on your shirt. I don't know. Great production of the shirt. There it is. Oh, oh. <laughs> a little bit clear, yeah. There it is. And you see the tips of the toes there. There's rub there. Yeah. That's number the number one spot usually is the toes and and the back, the uh, back of the torso. Yeah. All right. That's it. That's it. All right. So that's that's uh. That's it for Bosk. And next we're going to go over to Well, let's let's the make a nice stick. smooth the transition. Variant. Let's make a nice smooth transition Whoa. to a droid transition. Transition to a droid who's also a bounty <laughs> hunter. Mm -hmm. And for the young folks watching, this is not IG11. It's IG88, the original uh, OG bounty hunter droid who looks like this and he comes with two accessories we're going to have uh, john talk about that in a moment this is a i mean this is a really cool looking figure this had to be you know empire strikes back was when i was you know a couple of years old so i was collecting these figures just like a you know maybe a year or two after they came out St still pretty contemporary but for the folks who were older and could really, you know, inspect these figures for what they were in the character. This has to be a pretty exciting figure. I mean, it's a it's a bounty hunter droid, different looking than anything else in the line to this point. Um, a very tall figure, you know, that's just kind of fun as a kid uh, that it was one of the taller figures, you know, like Vader was as well. Uh, there are two main versions that I can identify with this figure. Uh, one is considered more, uh, I think, like a like a light like a medium gray and one was a bit m metallic uh is that right one was like a flat and one was like a metallic uh yeah, finish to it like a pearlescent basically i think they call it silver and gray yeah so if you had a, a handful of them next to each other and you had one of each in the mix you know you could see the difference there uh, again this is another one where you just have one figure in front of you you're not going to really uh, have an easy time identifying which it is but um you know to most folks it doesn't matter um there's not a lot of paint on this figure brandon's going to talk about the condition but um this is mostly a molded figure the head swivels it's got four limbs that that uh you know swivel as well like like most of the figures and it was just cool that it came with two accessories so let's throw it over to john and and learn about those yeah uh ig88 was probably my one of my favorite second favorite character from empire strikes back when i was a kid you know boba fett of course being the first one but it was just cool to see this robot who was we didn't even have a clue what he could do you we know, still don't because we don't yeah because he's on screen for 10 seconds yeah but we knew he was up to no good because he was a bounty hunter but <clears throat> he comes with two accessories which was really cool back in the day you know one, i think it was one of the first ones to have multiple accessories right i think he was the first one to have multiple accessories um because this came out before cloud car pilot right and before bespin luke or about the same time unless you don't yeah unless you're not counting like a luke farm boy that has a yeah you know, i mean a uh, princess leia that has a cape and a blaster but, yeah not really counting you know. a cape as much as an accessory as like a you know the weapons or the blasters or whatever but but yeah they started doing they started adding to the line about this time and giving people multiple things like, you know, the, the calm pilot or the calm for the cloud car pilot and the blaster and IG 88 came with two blasters. He comes with a, and these are always blue. 
Uh, so if you want to match, if you want to match uh, the uh, accessories with the figure, they're always blue, right? And he has a unique rifle too. He's another one that has a unique rifle. This rifle doesn't go with anyone else, and uh, he does have a blue Imperial Blaster too. So, right. very cool figure, IG88, one of my favorites. All right, cool. Uh, Brandon, let's start over to you to talk about the condition of this fella. This will be pretty quick. Usually the number one thing I look for is the bandolier across his chest and his back. Um, always hard to find a real nice one. Again, one of those figures, if I find a completely black bandolier with really nice paint, I'll probably keep it because mm -hmm. uh, I can never find one. Usually, I mean, this figure was played with a lot. He was a fan favorite, so kids would really put him through the ringer there and scratch him up pretty good. As far as like any other paint, he's got paint on his head there, those orange uh, dots. But other than, than the black and the orange there, he doesn't have any more paint applications. So this is an easier figure to find without, you know, a bunch of, you know, paint missing and, and all that. And the only other thing that this figure has, you know, some plastic degradation here and there. Um, you'll find some figures. I don't know if they were original or not, but you'll see like a little bit of a hue, like a, like a brownish hue to some of them. I just wonder if that's paint degradation over the years or whatever. But, um, you know, other than that, you just check in the limbs and make sure that there's nothing that's too loose on there and that the legs are nice and straight. Just like the EV99 and the 88, these are prone to having the legs kind of bow a little bit. Bow. Um, yeah. It's a softer so plastic for those legs. Softer, you know, softer plastic, thin legs, easier for them to kind of bow out. Uh, kind of like Twizzlers. There, so. <laughs> yeah. So that's another thing you look for as well. Make sure he can stand up and that his legs are straight. But, uh, you know, other than that, you're checking maybe for some melt marks on him or some scuffing or whatever. And like I said, kids will play with him pretty hard, so they might have, you know, jacked him up pretty good. But uh, other than that, it's a pretty easy figure to find a nice shape. And what else uh, – what other uh... – I don't see variants or what other things have been referred to with this figure. Am I, is this the figure that has the red eye or the orange eye? No, you're, he has the hollow tubes. The hollow, the hollow yeah, eyes, tubes. right? Yeah. And I think there's extended tubes also. No, that's uh, Tuscan no, Raider. that's a Tuscan Raider. I think. I think so. No, they have the hollow tubes and the or the hollow eyes and the not hollow eyes. Okay. Yeah. I thought it had just another variant that Chris used to say about the the orange or the red. What was it? The red face or the red dot or something? The red that's eye a, or the orange eye? Yeah, but we're talking a PBP right now. We're not talking U.S. Kenner. Hmm. Right. Okay. So Yeah, so once you start getting into some of the foreign versions of these figures that were produced uh, at other factories around the world, you're going to start yeah, seeing some additional orange, differences. Yeah, orange, red, but... yellow. It's different colors in a different factory. Like the same okay. <clears throat> but okay. price-wise, price, price wise, you have to remember that the Blue Blaster is $15.00. His rifle, no one wants it. No one cares. It's five to seven dollars. I probably have fifty of them right here, honestly, at my house. You use them as toothpicks, is that right? Yeah, honestly, a lot of people that buy them from me are doing custom figures, and then they arm the custom figures with that blaster. Normally, so that's like right. five to seven bucks. IG eighty eight all together, twenty five dollars, twenty eight all day. I would never spend any more than that. Done. Okay. It used to be a lot more, but yeah, know. I mean, I remember when it was you know thirty five dollars, forty bucks. I think it was maybe yeah. the peak. Yeah, not anymore. You know, because those blue blasters were peaking at like twenty bucks, right? And the blue, the blue blacks were hitting like twenty four or something. And his, at one point. his rifle was selling for twelve. Yeah, so, so the they're right there selling for twelve. The blaster is twenty. That's thirty two. You add five bucks for him, and yeah, it could be thirty five, thirty eight dollars. But yeah, no one cares anymore. So. <laughs> All right, very good. So that's IG88, and and just one last thing is, you know, we commented we don't know what he could do, and that was true for so many years. But to me, that's one of the great things about the Mandalorian is, you know, you got to see the same model mm -hmm. droid in IG11. And then all of a sudden, you could actually see him in action in a in a battle scene. And I mean, you know, folks like us almost fell off our couch because we had no idea he could spin his torso and. And it's flip his arms around and shoot two people at the same time and, you know, target them with, the, the, you know, robotic computer. I mean, it was amazing. So little did we know that's what, what IG-88 could probably do. 
Uh, we never got to see him in action. All right, so the final figure for this episode, folks, is, uh, and I hope you're enjoying this, we're trying to uh, cover these figures somewhat quickly. We're not going into insane detail about every COO and version that's out there, but we did want to cover these figures in a, you know, in a thorough way for the average collector. So hope you're enjoying this series. Uh, please come on back for the next one where we'll cover four more figures from Empire Strikes Back. This is FX7. This is the one of the two medical droids from Empire. And we see this droid, uh, I, I guess we see it in the same scene, I think, with 2-1-B. Am I right on that? He's mm -hmm. One's on one side of the room, one's on the other. I specifically remember playing with this figure just because I, it must have made some impression on me early on as you know f a four-year-old or something with all these arms that came out and i didn't i, I kind of remember not understanding what all these arms were for but i thought it was cool that his head can raise up and it's this picture is showing his head uh extended right now and his head could raise up he could spin around um maybe this is what i was thinking about with the orange eye and the red eye on the fx7 right yep. and he's got the one arm uh, on the midsection there it looks like you could maybe turn it around his body, but it, you can't. That that band around the middle is glued in place. But that that white arm is flexible. It's painted, so that's one of the you know the few paint apps on this figure. Uh, just it was a cool figure. I don't know if it was you know especially fun to pretend you're playing a Star Wars hospital, but you could really make this figure whatever you wanted it to be in in, in your imagination. It was cool because it had a lot of moving pieces, which not all the figures had. So FX7 medical droid. Actually, I believe this was this referred to as the surgical droid. I think it was, and in, in you know in some circles, and then the two one B was the, the medical droid. John, I'm going to throw it over to you for the accessory. Please tell us, <laughs> tell us uh, anything you would like to about this figure. Do you remember this figure? And uh, it didn't yeah. have an accessory, but what do you what do you want to share? Well, the uh, the arms flippy flap, mm -hmm. and there's like eight of them, and they flippy flap. Oh, flippy flap. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, that, I used to love this figure because you could, you know, take out. Oh, I just need this arm to you to do this, and this arm on this guy can do that. And uh, there aren't really any accessories to it. Uh, the head should stay up, though. That's the thing about FX7 that you don't that people, you know, his head should stay up and be able to turn, and then it and it should be able to to lower freely. But sometimes you pull the head up and it just pops right back down. It's not good. Um, but I think the, the I think the band does rotate around the figure. It does not. No, what? I the band with his arm doesn't it rotate? I around? I always wished it. No, would. the head's the only thing that rotates. No, just a okay. Head. Maybe yeah. it was like the Power of the Force two two. And I don't know why they did that because you know if they had just that, man. no if they had just left that band like you know a complete circle and just around you know the midsection. So that you could turn it, it would have been amazing. Like it would have been yeah. a nice extra feature. And here's the problem with his arms, the flippity flap that John refers to. Once you flippity it, it doesn't go flappity back. Like you can't, <laughs> <laughs> you can't yeah. stick them back right. in. So now that it's like that, it's like that forever. Yeah. Have That's you it. guys ever, you know, we're we're talking about accessory real quick. Have you guys ever seen this figure? Not that you can take it apart without breaking it, basically, but have you ever seen this figure apart? Uh, specifically how those arms are inside the figure. No. no. It's really cool. The, on the top of those white arms is a ring, is a white ring. So they're all attached to a single ring. That's basically, you know, when they put the figure together, it's inserted into uh, that part of the figure, and then they, they, they sonic welded it. But that, if you ever saw that, those arms separately out of the figure, it's a ring with them all attached. It's pretty cool. So that's how they build that. It's always cool to see how they they put it, the things together and how the pieces are made. Brandon, tell us about the condition. What are you looking for in this guy? Well, real quick, the better version of this figure is the Power of the Force 2 one. So that one actually looks a lot nicer. Um, this is a wrong episode, Brandon. Oh, sorry. I hate this figure. I mean, Different sorry. Um, <laughs> condition... Uh, John said it right. The thing you're looking for the most on this one is a tight head. So if you pull real hard on the head and it stays up like that, then you got a good one. If 
You pull up on the head and it uh, flops back down. It floppity, flappity, flappity. Well, back if you down. if you floppity it, it might not <laughs> flap again. So, oh yeah. Well, obviously the paint apps on this figure. It's got the, the red eye there, which always has rub on it, just like this one. Uh, a couple other paint on the on the head there, but usually there's no rub on that one. You got to check that red eye and the black ring around the neck area as well. And the number one item on this figure that always has rubs is that uh, one stationary arm that uh, is sticking out, protruding to the right. Um, check the arm. Check that there's paint on there. A lot of paint rub area on that. And also that that arm has uh, is like rubber, I think, or soft yeah, plastic, it's and soft it plastic. bends. It'll bend. Sometimes it'll break, so don't tug on it too hard. And um, but yeah, just check for the paint on there because it's always, you know, paint rub city on that on that arm there. But yep, get one with a nice tight head and, and uh, make sure that the appendages are tucked in and not floppity about, and then you'll you'll be good. Yeah, and and that if you do find one with a nicely painted arm there that does not have a lot of rub or don't bend it because that soft plastic or that rubber, if you bend it, I've seen. Plastic. I've seen where the paint has flaked off before. Yeah, it cracks so the paint right off. It cracks the paint right off. So do, don't even touch that arm. If you find a nice one, um, leave it as is because after, you know, 40-something years, that paint will come off. It'll crack. Um, also, I've seen, Brandon, the uh, the arms, so the, the eight arms or however many arms there are, I've seen those yellowed plenty of times too. So oh, you want to yeah. look and, you know, find ones that are still nice and white. Uh, bright white and not uh, discolored. Uh, Chris, this is going to be a tough one for you. If you can pull out your um, your I spreadsheet and your <laughs> yeah your price guide, tell Dude, us. Can we play uh, closer to the pin? I mean, it's like when <laughs> when you come into prices on him, no one really cares. Like I'm not like other figures. There can be like a high and a low. This one, if it was like a mint one, and it's twelve bucks if you're lucky. Otherwise, like that, like right there, if I had that one, that's $6 with the arm sticking out and you can't put him back in. He's not expensive at all. He's not hard to find. You know, I, I would never spend more than $12, $15 ever if it was the mintest example you ever found. Like, don't go there. So keep it cheap. He's not hard. And a boring figure. Just boring. Burn. Yeah, I think as an you know as an adult you know you realize this is not the most exciting character you know of course um, he's another um, one that's in a scene for all of ten seconds but for some reason I do remember you know just enjoying like all the moving parts on this one one thing we didn't do as we wrap up this episode Chris is uh, in previous episodes we've talked a little bit about grading and and specifically <laughs> what is worth grading just doing a quick rundown of course Boba Fett. A nice Boba Fett, well, absolutely worth grading. Yeah. Here's the thing. Everyone needs to realize this now. With grading being $80 a figure and then shipping back and forth and insurance, they kind of priced out majority of these figures from being graded. At least that's in my loose. opinion. Yeah, definitely the loose, right? Yeah, definitely when it Especially comes to the loose, loose figures. So, like, yeah, you can still grade a Boba Fett and you can still grade a Bosque. You have to hope it gets an 85 and up for it to be anything worth it. Um, FX7, absolutely not. Just take it, throw it in dumpster. Don't ever grade that thing. It's just it's not worth it. If you grade it, it's actually worth it's actually worth less money. Um, <laughs> IG88, no one cares about. Honestly, like you just you can't grade the figures anymore. There's there's no value in it anymore. You're spending too much money to grade it, and shipping and the insurance. By the time you're done, it's probably less than like it's like a hundred bucks. Yeah. Now, so, as of this recording, uh, we've gotten some news, you know, more recently that AFA is going to start loose grading again. And uh, I believe they're coming out with a price that's a little bit more friendly. So dollars, yeah. while you're, you know, you as a viewer, while you're watching this, you might, you know, be familiar with current grading prices. As of now, we're seeing the chance that they might be a little bit more friendly going forward. So then you might be waffling a little bit in the middle with some of these figures. Like, okay, maybe this is worth it. This is a really, really nice example. But if you're new to grading, it's hard to make that judgment, you know, as to whether the condition is worth grading or not. 
if you're not sure, you know, uh, put it on, you know, put it on your shelf and enjoy it. Put it in a, in an acrylic if you want to do that to protect it. Uh, put it on a stand. I don't know. Some people don't like putting them on a peg stands, but go ahead and display it. Um, and I mean, uh, don't worry about you know preserving it so much if it's a twelve dollar figure. You know, figures like this. If you really want to get it graded, just buy it graded already. It's not going to cost you a lot of money. Again, it's going to cost you a hundred to one hundred and twenty five dollars instead of you taking a chance, waiting six months, and then getting a freaking eighty. It's just not worth it anymore. This is yeah. a figure that you buy graded already if you want it for your collection. And if you don't, don't grade it. Not yeah. worth it. That's fair. That's fair. Mm -hmm. so. All right. Well, that's going to do it for this episode of the Ultimate Guide to Collecting Vintage Kenner Star Wars Figures. Thanks very much for hanging out with us. We have new episodes every Sunday at 6 p.m. Eastern. And, of course, uh, our Wednesdays, Wins and Whiffs come out each week on Wednesday at 6 p.m. Thanks for hanging with us. Please check out our Patreon for more content and a way for you to support the show. If you like what we're doing, we'd appreciate it. You can like this video, comment, and subscribe to this channel. Patreon.com slash 5 Idiots Talking Toys for our exclusive 5 Idiots After Dark episodes and previews to everything else we do. Collectibles that will be for sale and all of our content. Thanks for watching. We will see you next time on 5 Idiots. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.